everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Very excited about today's conversation. My name is Frank Wassenberg, um, CCAS practice leader at CloudLinks. Uh, and I am Kevin Sheehan, Frank's youthful ward. <laughs> so, so thank you, Robin, for the handoff. Um, what we're going to do is have an interesting conversation today with Thea Rasmussen. She's a solution engineer from Vonage, and she's interesting for the uh, she's an interesting person for us to have on the call today because she's involved in everything pre-sales but since Vonage does a lot of work in development of of APIs and uh, contact center integration she's also gets to carry these things through these deployments through to the end of the of the deployment window so she's very interesting uh, she's gonna give us some very interesting insights into the CCAS world today so Thea thank you very much for joining us Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Frank. No, super excited to have you. And unfortunately, that's my past phrase when I get a little nervous. Super excited. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, listen. Today, it, it's actually exciting because what what I what I feel like I know of Vonage, and what I know of your guys' strategy in the contact center world, I, I feel like I know it because I've had a hundred conversation with you guys on it. I don't feel like the world in general knows really what Vonage's overall strategy has been with Contact Center. So I'll, I'll throw some questions out to you. Maybe you can illuminate a little bit of what that's going to look like for us. Um, mm -hmm. But let's start off with a little bit of, you guys have kind of chosen to buy something versus building something. So I'm very interested in talking to me a little bit about that strategy with you guys with the acquisition of New Voice Media. Well, it's interesting because we've had the experience in both realms. We did a partnership previous to our acquisition of New Voice Media with Nice and Contact. We were doing a white label resell like other providers in the market are. So we've had that experience with the partnership model and the consolidated billing because that's really what it is, right? You have two separate product sets and two separate worlds in the cloud environment and you're bringing them together for ease of, of billing and customer support. So what we wanted to do is take a step back. Um, you know, we have been very acquisition heavy in the last 10, 15 years, as, as you all know, and probably the industry as a, as a whole knows as well. So that's really evolved not only the UC side of our business, but also the CC side. So as we evolved from, you know, reselling Broadworks clusters, you know, after the Cisco acquisition into our own proprietary network on UC, that really led the charge to say, you know, this whole owning our own stack and owning our own technology gives us a real edge. And so we also looked at other silos in the marketplace that people weren't really playing in um, from a consolidation perspective. And we decided to acquire our own contact center solution. And that's where New Voice Media came into play. Um, so we are, of course, still supporting all of our customer base that's using the Nice and Contact solution. And that's still a really nice marriage. Sure. Um, Absolutely. But we also have our own in-house application and, ca and capability in the contact center CCAS space. And why that's important is because we saw the growth and the customization just flower as soon as we just brought all of our upmarket customers to our in-house UC side. And we wanted to do the same on the CC side. And we also saw a gap in the market to say there's really very few vendors and competitors out there in the industry that own both and have that synergy across both platforms. Yeah, I think that's one of the interesting case studies when you really have a conversation on it is owning the UC platform, owning the CC platform gives you some enhancements that over most of what the suppliers are. Um, and it's funny, as I say that, you know, I I'm getting into the thought process of that must actually give you guys some really cool capabilities to create some, um, some really cool integrations or some really cool capabilities that other people just can't do natively mm -hmm. or seamlessly i should say there's apis and the like but you guys being on one platform probably gives you a deeper a deeper capability set it really does um and so when you look at you know they really start very simplistically the benefits of having the same uc and cc platform um so you're looking at things like i have a shared directory right what's the interaction between your contact center and your back office users is there an interaction at all are they completely disparate? Because if so, it doesn't really matter that we own our own stack, right? It could just be a convenience. But if there's interaction between the back office and the contact center, that really comes into play. Um, because now I can look just like I would transfer to an agent and I can see back office users and their presence information because I'm cohesively on a single platform. 
vice versa, the back office users that are fielding calls that didn't get to the contact center that need to be escalated into a contact center agent's world, they can now transfer seamlessly through their UC application and get that directly into the contact center environment as well with presence information. So presence is key there because I think the big hole that everyone just steps back from in the industry when we're talking about advanced contact center is what happens if I have an existing phone, right? And I pick up and I make just a direct call, not from my contact center application. What happens? Well, the contact center can't see I'm busy. That's what happens. And yeah. I still get an inbound call and it becomes a mess. And all advanced contact centers are, you know, overlaid on top of existing architecture, which we can do too. Huge benefit. Sometimes that's a fit. But having the capability to say, if you use us for the entire stack you see in CC, and I pick up my handset and make an outbound call, I'm automatically defaulting my agent status to outbound personal call. I'm reporting on that information. Everyone can see that, including the context and our routing rules that I'm putting in place. And it's just a much more cohesive platform. That's the baseline of it. So the feature functionality that nobody talks about because people can't do, right? Yeah, yeah no one wants to say that doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, doesn't exist. Right. That's, that's, not, that's not valuable. Right. Now, and you're that's probably... something new that we're rolling too right now because it took some time. You acquire and then you have to marry two completely separate organizations on the back end to make that happen, right? It's Absolutely. not something you can do out of, the, out of the gate. So it's an exciting, exciting thing that we're rolling. And it probably gives you some capabilities to do, to, to, to enhance kind of like franchising, remote office environments. It probably gives you some capabilities to pull in subject matter experts that you don't want to pay for a contact center seat. It allows you to probably broaden the scope of what clients would normally get in terms of expertise, because those end users, that's a, whatever, let's call it an engineer or some sort of subject matter expert, you're not going to buy them a contact center seat, but they may be a resource to you that now you can see, you can actively pull in and you can have one seamless client journey, make it real easy for you. Mm -hmm. So there's actually um, a recent customer that I worked with, with a, with a similar situation. So they were an existing contact center customer of ours. And they came to the table and said, hey, we're thinking about adding our outside sales team, which is a massive group, right? To the contact center as agents, but they're super mobile right? And they're using their own cell phones today. You know, how do we in ingrain that into the contact center? And when you think about a contact center agent, I mean, we, we're scratching the surface on making those people truly mobile friendly from a cell phone perspective, because you're in front of your CRM, you're embedded in your CRM, you're logging your activity. I mean, that's what we know as true contact center and omni-channel, but there's also a need set that kind of scratches the service of what contact center offers in the mobile field. And so we took a look and said, you know, why are we licensing these people for contact center when really they just need this subset? And so that goes to show how we can really come in and say, okay, these people don't need to be contact center users. They can be UC users. We still, because of our acquisition of GUnify, have a very tight integration and very aggressive integration on the UC side. So as I'm answering on my mobile device, outside the office, we're still auto-logging activity back into the Salesforce instance, right? So that omni-channel Salesforce interaction and that data is still being stored cohesively in the same org. But then you're also saying, okay, but the thing is, is they're cell phone users now. You know, there's those little nuances to the problem. Yeah. So I can't port all their cell phone numbers, right? Yeah. You don't port those over to a UC solution. So how am I sending out a single cohesive number without changing their DIDs and getting them back to the right person when they call back inbound. That's a contact center functionality. That's like, okay, I got to dip into Salesforce to see who you're tied to as a contact, who owns you. And so that we can do using smart numbers. So we can just take a nuance of a contact center and that's what we're finding a lot of and say, okay, maybe you don't need a full blown contact center solution. You just need this head end solution that dips into a database, doesn't have to be Salesforce and makes a routing decision so I have a single number reach, but I'm getting to the correct agent. And now all of those, all of those users can have new numbers, but they're pushing out a single toll free, right? That we're enabling on our actual Vana APIs for the next one acquisition, right? So we're taking all these acquisitions together and you have this cohesive solution that's not overselling a customer something they don't really need, right? So Nexmo was an interesting acquisition. I, I like that you mentioned it. And, and it always comes to mind whenever I talk to your engineering teams, whenever I go on the demos for your platform, it always seems that there's this very distinct difference between building applications 
and doing APIs, but you guys are still really, really cool with how you develop things for clients. Now you come up with these custom applications, but you're not really an application building shop. You're doing some APIs, you're not going to host it, but you're doing some little nuances with it. And I think th there's probably some class of clarification that needs to happen in that realm because I go to the demos for you guys and everyone does, they talk about it. Look at this cool thing that we've done for this client. We've, we've had this go to this and ping to that and ping to that and go to there and all of a sudden, now they can see where how far away the nurse is and how far away they are from getting their care and they can all talk on their cell phone. But it's not really like an application that you guys are building. You might just give me a little bit of a distinction between those two because I think sometimes when I even when I sit down I listen to these and it sounds like you guys are building apps with Nextmo, but that's not really the key. that's not really the key, right? That's not really what you're trying to do. It's a really it's, sexy sales pitch for salespeople to say that. Yeah, let's build yeah. you a custom app, right? But that's just not really realistic and that's not the way that the industry works and that's not where the use case fits in. So when you talk about application development and APIs, totally different things, okay? okay? So yes, we have our own API platform and our own API stack. Um, so we're competing in the industry with the Twilio's of, of the world, right? When you think about that. Um, but what happens is when you talk about an application, that's actually intellectual property for a company. If we were to sit and develop applications for customers, they would be industry specific to warrant that build and that custom dev in, internally for us. And then we would want to resell that to all your competitors. So it's much better if you have an application or you have a website or you're using an existing application, even if it's from a different pro provider and not proprietary to you, so that you own that unique IP. You know, you're trying to distinguish yourselves in the industry at that point, right? Whether it's a CX distinguishing factor or enabling diff different digital interactions or enabling something you've already created, you want to own that. What Vonage comes in and does is we enable that application for communication, whether it's voice, whether it's text, whether it's messaging via Facebook, WhatsApp, you know, whatever. Um, we're enabling that communication with not only voice, SMS, all of that, but also video as well. So it's it's a different conversation. And as much as the conversation is so sexy to talk about APIs and application development, you know, customers really like products. And so I think what's unique about us is that we're we're good at both, right? So you're going to have those massive organizations that have that build mentality. They say, you know, you're right. We want our own intellectual property and we just want to use your APIs, we're going to build something totally from scratch, right? We, do, we want to build our own context center. We want to build our own UC suite, right? And it's going to be amazing. And they, and they you know, misvalue um, the option to having a nice base, right? That's a lot of work. That's a massive undertaking. That's literally <laughs> what Vonage does for them. Yeah, you know? no, I'll build my own context center. It's fine. I got four guys over there. They'll do it easy. But you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. As soon as they get a big, hearty in in-house dev, you know, those enterprise organizations, yeah. they're like, let's do it. We got this, you know? And that's where the Amazon connects and the Twilio's come into play. And they're like, okay, we're going to build our own world. Um, but really what's nice about Vonage is that we can marry the two together and we can play in the gray area where a lot of those enterprise customers live. And so when we, we talk about that, it's not a buy or build conversation. It's let me buy a baseline and then build with the APIs that are in that single stack. So from a security perspective, you're not reaching out to a separate network at that point to enable other things and, and customize your solution. There's a huge security component to that. You could rabbit hole that, but keep me away from that. Um, so <laughs> there's that whole conversation, um, but now you don't have to pick. You can have a baseline of, of standard UC functionality that you need, table stakes. You can do that on both UC and you can also do that on CC, which we, we see more often when we're talking about customization, honestly. Um, and so you can take things like Nexmo and you can take our acquisition of over AI, which is the artificial intelligence leg with natural language processing and all that fun stuff. And you can build all of that on a single IP stack, which is part of the reason why they want to build themselves. It's because they don't want to piecemeal their solution together, right? Yeah. They want it to live in their own network for security purposes. And you're getting the best of both worlds there. No one else is doing that in the industry right now. So that's, that's a really exciting conversation to have. And, th and now when you get into the AI portion of that, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> everybody talks about AI like it's this, you know, it's, it's the other end of the rainbow, right? It's going to solve problems. <laughs> are you a proponent of AI taking over the conversation? Or are you a proponent of AI making the agent more enabled? Which, which side of the coin do you kind of fall on as an engineer? 
I'm in the happy, I'm in the realistic realm, I'd like to say. <laughs> um, so I think that AI de de developed and deployed properly takes the easy stuff off the agent's plate. So that innately is going to say, okay, my tier one level agents, yeah, it might be displacing some agents. And yeah. that's where the cost justification comes into play. But it raises the bar on both the machine learning and AI capabilities as well as the agent aptitude. Okay. So you're raising the bar on both. They're, they're not going to replace human interaction. Not anytime in the near future. Not when we're selling this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> For sure. I agree. And I don't think that's the intent. And I think that that's the misconception a lot of times. Um, so we had a couple of good use cases that really proved this point out, you know, with this whole COVID situation as well. So um, AI is really coming into play because it's a really easy supplemental service that doesn't have to disrupt the apple cart in regards to the underlying infrastructure. So we had one um, scenario on the West Coast. Um, it was a food bank on the West Coast that came to us and said, listen, obviously we're having an insane influx of inbound calls. Um, and we can't uplift our contact center solution right now. We're in contract. It's going to be too costly. It's going to be too, you know, time consuming. I just can't, that's not a solution. How can you help me? Some prem based so we thing were, they had, right? Some legacy system. That's what you're talking about. Sure. I will, the competitor will remain unnamed. Yeah, it was yeah, hosted, yeah. but, but yeah. the competitor oh, it will was remain hosted. Unnamed. It was actually it was hosted? Classy. Was hosted. Was hosted. I like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Stay classy. Um, yep. Yep. San Francisco. It was West Coast too. Okay. So when we talk about what we were able to come in and do is we were able to supplement the inbound call flow and put a virtual assistant in front of that. We call it a virtual assistant. It's an AI bot. Okay. Right. So now that virtual assistant's like, okay, if you're calling to find the nearest food shelter, press two. And now I'm taking all of those calls off of all of the agent behavior. So I'm taking those off before they even hit the contact center. Okay. So peeling off that additional influx. And then we, the way it actually worked, which I think is interesting, um, you basically say, hey, you know, what's your, what's your zip code? They enter their zip code and they'll give them an option of whatever food pantries are in the region that they're in. You know, here's your three options. Which one would you want more info on? Oh, I want Cathedral Hill. Great. Um, Cathedral Hill is open from eight to two and here's the address. And then we, of course, put our little Vonage spin on it and said, would you like us to SMS you a Google map to get there? You know, and so then they can text uh, Google map and have an interactive flow that way. So that took enough, actually quite a bit of what the influx was on the inbound side. And we didn't have to displace, you know, we're looking to assist in this case. And that's a fun use case because we're forced to get creative in that situation. Right. And we're and, and it's not about the entire stack, even though we have that capability at Vonage. That's not our mentality. It's very rare that we have customers that say, I need all of your stuff. They That's don't true. say that. They say, I have that. this niche need. Can you help me? And then as the contract comes up for the hosted stuff, guess who they're going to talk to, right? The people that jumped in and helped them during the crisis. And that's, that's the provider you want to be, right? That's the fun stuff. Yeah. So, so you kind of look at it as let the AI triage let the AI enable the agents to, when they when they are needed to spend more time with the client. I mean, that's been a, a kind of recurring theme that Kevin and I have seen is where if you're not enabling the agent to spend more time with the client, you're stuck in that mentality of get them off the phone quick because it's expensive and we want to handle as many calls as possible. You, you're, you're kind of saying use AI to get rid of that stuff. Use AI before it even bothers an agent. Let it do what it's going to do. That's static information. That's something that can query any database, move on. We want your agents to be enabled. And that's where, again, where your sales guys may say that's something that you built custom for them, but that's something that you added onto it. That's pretty cool. That, that SMSing of the address and the map, that those are really cool experience things. Because again, if I'm looking for a food bank per se, it comes right there on my phone. I know where to go. That's hugely valuable to everybody in the organization, even the CEO of the food bank. They must right. look at that thing as saying, the, the, the experience people get with us, he, that's something that he or she can talk about when they're at a fundraising gala. Look, look, look at what we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's hugely valuable. And the other part of that is the transition into a live agent. That's really important because you can take these agentless interactions away and deal with the initial insight, but then people need more information from there. 
because what's going to happen is, you know, Gartner sees it. All of the, all of the researchers are seeing it. Everyone's moving towards, they want the capability to self-serve and they like that na natural language processing because it's just a, the way we innately communicate as humans. So that's all great, but there's always going to be a point at which you have to transition. And so I'm a huge proponent of announcing that you are an AI chatbot. Okay. Hi, okay. I'm a computer. Give me a chance. If I can't help you, I'm going to transfer you to someone who can. Mm -hmm. And having the contextual transfer is huge. That's everything right there. Because even if you're providing some kind of low level, just informative information and taking that heat off the contact center to, like you said, sp spend time with your customers where you need to, if I can't transition into the contact center and talk to a live agent and have them know exactly what I've already covered with the chatbot, that's, I just broke it. <laughs> there's so no, there's no need. There's no need to even implement it. Don't even waste your time. And I think that that's where it comes into play with being our stack. Because there's a ton of very cool AI companies out there that you can just bolt onto a solution like we did at, with a food bank. Um, but there's a lot of nuance on the back end and a lot of benefit to keeping that interaction in the same IP stack as you're traversing between different types of channels, live agents, and different digital types of interactions as well. So a, a lot can be said on that front. So Kevin, I just went through a demo with, with another contact center provider before, right? They asked us to kind of evaluate it, see where they are in relation to the market. And one of the interesting things they talk about, and I feel like we talk about it a lot, is that that argument of, are you an omni-channel provider or are you a multi-channel provider? And that's one of these, I see a smirk a little bit there, and that's why the video is nice, because you, you got that smirk <laughs> that says, oh, that's a big distinction, you know, we can talk yeah. about that, I don't want to. But that's one of those things that people kind of get hung up on the weeds on. And I think with the way you guys talk about it is, if you can't, pa the, the way, I want to make sure I get the phrasing kind of right when you said, if you can't pass along the context of what you just spoke about in the other channel, it's useless. And if you can't seamlessly migrate to the next channel, it's useless. It's not omnichannel, it's multi. Um, where do you guys fit into that mix and, and, and that, that, that thought process? I, that's a really good question because the way we do things is really unique on that front. Um, so when we look at our omni-channel solution, when we purchased New Voice Media and went down that path, we went all in with Salesforce. That was a decision that the company made, right? They niched themselves into that solution for omni-channel. We do not have a standalone omni-channel solution today, okay? Now, when you look at that solution though, it's extremely powerful. And there's a reason why they made that decision. You know, Salesforce is the mammoth in the room. There is plenty of business to be had with the Salesforce customers, right? And we, yeah. we decided to differentiate ourselves there first and then build out from there. Okay, so as we're going to be adding new, of course, ServiceNow is the first, and we're going to be adding additionals. But the way we do omnichannel is we're utilizing the digital interactions from Salesforce. So you're using Live Agent, for example, okay, and that's their web-based chat, and we're using their Einstein chatbot, okay, and that is completely synced seamlessly from an omnipresence perspective with our voice platform. I'm going to pause there because that's the key, right? Because I need to be able to have presence and make decisions to say, I want to take this many of this type of interaction and this many of that type of interaction. And so the, the capability of Omni, true Omni, and not a siloed multi-channel environment is still there. But the benefit of those digital channels coming from Salesforce is extremely powerful. Because then you're talking about having everything cohesively living in the same platform from a reporting perspective because we're driving all of our voice information already into that platform for historical reporting. So now I have a cradle to grave report and I have the capability to track that conversation, GUID if you will, right? Through from a voice to, I escalated to, or I, or I started a chat, I escalated a voice and then I sent an SMS, right? That's a normal type of interaction today. So all that lives there, but then you're talking about a lot less API calls a lot more cohesive agent workflow. And I can't talk enough about reporting, right? The reporting all lives in your customer CRM because if I'm driving reports for Omnichannel in through different channels externally into Salesforce, I mean, you have to really take a look at, people don't have that conversation. They, they say in their RFP, they're like, yes, we can integrate to Salesforce. You know, yeah. what does that yes, mean? Yes, of course we can, yes. Everybody does. 75 <laughs> API calls later. 
<laughs> right. And so then all of a sudden you're like, oh, so I'm, I'm out of luck because I made my 24 hour threshold of API calls and nobody wanted to have that conversation. Right. Um, so the fact that we, we are that in depth and we're that we're that ingrained in Salesforce and we let them do the heavy lifting as much as possible to consolidate everything into one place and a single source of truth is really powerful. Right. I think that there's a lot to be said there and that's why we win those opportunities and why we're comfortable at this stage in the game niching ourselves into that customer you know target market so i could i could go on all day if you have more questions on that but i'll pause there no i, I mean i the one thing you did warn me about when we did this call was not to let you go down the rabbit Don't hole let me go start. down the rabbit hole you'll go no, down the rabbit hole so, I, do that. <laughs> <laughs> so i'm not even going to bring up security i'm not going to bring up microservices i'm we'll, not even going to go we'll, down we'll those pause. roads yet because yeah. i don't want to lose you um, but I, I do like I do like the thought process behind that of um, you you pigeonholed, but for a strategic purpose, not just because of a capability limitation. You've said there's plenty of market to be had there. There's plenty of structure that we can go get that we can build within that, and let's just ride that. Let's I mean they are the 800 pound gorilla. Everyone knows that. But but now if I heard you correctly. You're also looking to build beyond that now. You, you're looking yeah. at ServiceNow next. Who else are you looking at? Or is ServiceNow kind of the, the one on the roadmap? ServiceNow. So we are, we've brought, we've brought our new voice media capabilities outside of Salesforce um, from a voice perspective already. Okay. So, you know, Vonage has a ton of, you know, we do the breadth as well as the depth on integration. So, you know, you have your Zendesks, you have your, your, your Zoho's, you have, you know, ServiceNow on that front. We're, we're talking about ServiceNow as a subset of Salesforce to say we're going to embed within ServiceNow like we are with Salesforce, right? So it's different to have the integration with those components, screen pop, data dip, have a nice day. Um, I mean, every, everyone can do that with everything. It's very easy to do that, right? Yeah. Um, but the level of in-depth integration that we have with Salesforce is unique, right, in the marketplace. And so when we look at ServiceNow, we have developed that and we're, we're beta testing that right now with existing customers and we're starting to get customers on that at this point in time. So that's going to look a lot like what you see um, the legacy new voice media or now Vonage Contact Center solution looking like within ServiceNow. Um, and with that, we're also going to start building up an external omni-channel interaction as well. Um, because we still want, we're not going to rebuild what's already working in Salesforce. That's not the intent. That wins all of those deals. I mean, that is a really good solution um, for a lot of different reasons. But what we do want to do is, is have the capability to live outside of Salesforce as well in the future. So um, ServiceNow is first on the docket, but we do have voice solutions from a contact center perspective with all of our standard integrations today out of the box. So I may have missed it there. Are you saying that you're building your own omnichannel service so that it could stand alone if somebody's like with a homegrown CRM? Or are you saying you're building one that's relying on Salesforce or you're building one that's relying on service now? I, I wasn't sure I heard the distinction. I just want to make sure I got it right. So right now, omnichannel, we only use Salesforce digital channels. So gotcha. we are building an omnichannel solution outside of that, and that will be applicable to all other integrations that we support. Oh, that's great. That's great. How far out in the roadmap is that, or is, is that yeah. down a rabbit hole? <laughs> it's a rabbit hole a little bit. Um, so we're working towards that, and of course, it's coming channel by channel. Um, it's going to start in a web chat. It's going to start in web chat and email and SMS, because those are the things that we do really well initially. Um, social media will probably be further out yet. Is is it just for service now, or would it be just you know across the board for Sugar, or, uh, you know Apollo, and all different types of CRMs? So when we talk about omnichannel, it will be standalone, right? So um, because ServiceNow doesn't really offer digital channels and those other applications don't offer it, yes, you'll be able, be able to apply it across the board. What we're doing uniquely with ServiceNow is we are using what they refer to as their CTI connector or embedding our voice within ServiceNow. And that's not necessarily the case with other CRMs, right? Yeah. Um, so other CRMs are still gonna live in your Vonage interface and interact, you know, on the back end from an integration perspective with screen pops and data dips, but they're not going to live in that CRM. So I hope that clarifies things a little bit. So Omni will be applicable across the board. It does, and it, it fits. Oh, go ahead, Kev. I think you got something. No, um, no, I was I was just going to ask, tying that to you know, what we're seeing during this time with a lot of call centers now having to send everybody working from home. Um, 
how rapidly could you deploy that that entire omni-channel suite? You know, typically, if somebody says, "Hey, we need to forklift, get away from the infrastructure we have in place right now," is that something that's really should be a measured migration, or is it something that can be done in, in a short amount of time? Um, it depends. I think it, it's unrealistic to go full omni-channel, rip and replace in a short period of time. I think right. the supplemental solutions that we're putting in place are are more realistic to do immediately. So it's kind of a, a crawl, walk, run approach on that front. I wouldn't kind of say, oh my gosh, we're going to have a up and running in 90 days. I mean, if you're a Salesforce user, yeah. If you need external stuff and it's all custom at this point, then yeah, it's going to be a heavier lift for I sure. Mean, Kevin and I are living in this world right now. We, we've done a bunch of calls and we've had a bunch of people come to us and say, is this true, right? And we've had... 3,000 agents, we've heard stories, 3,000 agents, 48 hours, migrate to the cloud, done, 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 right? And we hear all these kinds of stories. And that's where we kind of get into this, is this realistic expectation of what these offers are in the market today, right? You know, you've mm -hmm. seen them, right? you've seen them. You, you probably subscribe to all the same email distribution groups we do, where it says every five times a day, I get something that says rapid deployment or rapid enhancement. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the, uh, the Toyota commercials or the Volkswagen commercials now that are like, you know, the soft piano music. And then, then it says, <laughs> is everything going? Uh, we're here with you, buy a Toyota. You know, and it's, kind of, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of funny, right? There's classic videos. But, uh, you know, it's it's unrealistic to expect you guys to say, hey, get this done in 48 hours. I mean, you, you, you'll you get calls up, right? You'll get IVR, you'll get call flow set up. You're not going to get these integrations done that quick, right? Even to some people in like your app store, you're not going to have these up in 48 hours. Or are you saying, no, listen, well, if it's a certain sweet spot, yeah, voice, yeah. obviously, yeah, voice, you can get up without porting, but you'll get the voices up, mm -hmm. you'll get the voice flows oh, yeah. up, and you'll get calls, and especially now with the UC side, that actually makes you even more powerful, because you can just say, everyone go home, and mm -hmm. we'll get the UC stuff, we'll get the CC stuff, 48 hours, you're, you're square away on that, but Salesforce may have to do something a little with, with some hair pinning or, or, or something like that, I mean, where do you see the reality in these 48-hour deployments for people, because your sales well, guys are probably putting them. you onto yeah. those conversations. Well, we've done them. We've done them for sure. And so I think that it's it's about setting expectations. I think that's fair. Um, we can get pretty complex call flows built into the Salesforce solution that we have because it's so baked. You know, um, we are a no code solution that can customize into whatever custom objects, custom fields, custom call flows that people want. And it takes zero code. And that's not the case with the other providers. They'll give the certain, you know, I can screen pop a contact, an opportunity, a case. Great. Have a nice day. I can auto log the call. But we're talking about updating fields in Salesforce. We're talking about creating records as well in Salesforce. And those nuances are all out of the box, literally a check, a check box um, and an applet in our call flow. So we can get very complex voice solutions and have voice only solutions up and running very quickly. And sure. then, you know, you can have a siloed approach on the Omni channel. But again, uh, you want to be realistic with what, what's the baseline? What is it going to take to get you up and running and functional and add value day one um, or day two in a 48 hour deployment? You know, what is that going to look like? You know, you have to be realistic. And so we have our quick, our quick up and running UC and CC solutions, but they're very detailed and scoped, right? And of course, if it's, you know, 2000 agents, we'll just, work overnight and let's get it done. Um, but let's also make sure that it's voice only initially, right? Um, I think some of the cooler things that we've done in even less than 48 hours are in the telehealth space with our voice and video APIs from TalkBox. I don't know if you remember our acquisition of TalkBox. So HIPAA compliant video, clientless video, um, which is powerful, you know, in the telehealth space. Get, we've gotten solutions up and running for telehealth professionals in 24 hours using those APIs, building them into existing patient portals and websites and customizing that experience. And that is, I mean, those stories are, everyone's doing UC and CC voice deployments in 48 hours. I mean, everyone's yeah. going to tell you that they've done five yeah. and that's about how many they've done. And that's great. It worked out. Um, that's not the hard stuff, right? Um, I think that we have some some kind of more fun use cases with the food bank and the telehealth space. We also did, um, reminds me of another story with a, a big old travel agency on the East Coast, giant giant travel agency. Um, they're a customer of ours today, but they um, they actually had issues with, obviously, influx of cancellations of flights, Shop. you know? <laughs> I know. Um, and, so, and so we were able to automate that process because, again, when you talk about a travel agent, they do have to call the airline 
right? You have to call the airline in some instances to cancel that flight, depending on the status of that person. It's nuanced, but they couldn't field all of the people. And that's not necessarily a full AI, AI chatbot. It's not, you know, you need an agent. So they were able to take off the load in a more historical AI nature. So we have a product on our, on our, com, uh, on our contact center called Conversation Analyzer, which is basically speech analytics and full transcription. So we were able to say, okay, as opposed to doing a queued callback or waiting in queue for way too long to cancel your flight, they, they enlisted an option to say, okay, press two if you are having a flight cancellation within the next 24, 48 hours, whatever that looks like. And then they were able to leave a message, right, which seems simple, but we could actually go ahead and pull out the cancellation, the airline, you know, all the necessary phrasing oh, to get it done. And so they're not listening to the message. They just literally see the transcription and say, and categorize based on reporting to say, these are the American Airlines ones. And then they're automatically tagged to the contact in Salesforce. So you have all of that information, the frequent flyer number, all of that. So it's just like making that after work workflow a lot quicker. So not something you'd think of, but a solution that we had to jump in and get creative with really what was, quickly. What was, a, like, what was the percentage of drop rate on that? that? That has to be some percent of missed flight cancellations from it if you're going off of transcription. That's a really good question. I don't have the specifics yeah. on that, but that's a really good question. Yeah, like how many did they not do right? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that there's going to be obviously a component of error sure. on that front, um, of course. Uh, but I think that it moved the needle enough to make a difference, oh right? Um, and it took the simplistic part off. And I think that everything else would still have to fall into another queue of some sort for failover and say, call these people back. we're waiting for 45 minutes to an hour to talk to somebody, they're hanging up. So the flight's not getting canceled that that way either. Either, either so, way, you're out of luck, right? <laughs> <laughs> What's the positive delta, right, of, of the difference there? That's interesting. It is. I, I think it comes from uh, probably years of Kevin sitting next to me, and we, we've grown up a couple miles from apart, and my New York accent is probably way worse than his New York accent, and he can barely understand me at times. So imagine getting an AI <laughs> call with me versus him. It's, it's a massive difference. Now, now I've, heard, I've heard four acquisitions you guys have made, I think. Mm. There's it, more than that. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I was gonna say. I, it's just how many. How many are you guys up to right now in building this together? Because that's oh, got to yeah. be not only for the larger, more grandiose kind of strategy conversation, but just integration, just salespeople capabilities, say operations, the unsung heroes in the back end of those forty-eight hour deployments, those ops guys. I mean, that, that this is this is some road you guys are plowing, getting that many integrations done, that many purchases done to kind of create this strategy. It's been. I think it's been eight or nine at this point. Between, between all of it. It started out on the UC side and that was massive because you did Vocalocity, Telesphere, Simple Signal, i right out of the gate, right? And then you had the CC acquisition. Well, in between there, you had GUnify, which gives us all of our other integration capabilities. So we took that off the street, which was a Broadsoft integrator. And now we use that for everything, including our homegrown stuff and have truly enhanced that solution. Then we went you know, into the contact center, Nexmo space, Nexmo first, then contact center. We did our API stack. And then we did TalkBox for the, vo for the voice and video API component, which has been awesome in telehealth and education spaces. And especially right now with everything being remote. So broadcasting of messaging, that kind of thing. Um, and then our most recent was over AI, uh, the Will I Am company. So, oh, really? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so that is where our natural language processing is coming and a lot of other things are coming on the pike. So you're just starting to see the tip of the iceberg on what the AI stuff is gonna come into play with um, in the near future with some product rollouts. But the nice thing is, is like I said before, there's a lot of capabilities, but it's all about bringing them together and making them consumable for people. You know, it's a sexy yeah. conversation, but unless you productize it. So we have things that are just out of the box for us, like our business inbox, where we're enabling main numbers for texting on even our UC platform, right? So now I can have multiple people responding to an SMS message and not go full-blown contact center. We can also do that for Facebook messaging. And so I can tie my company's Facebook account to a group of people that respond and they're not toggling between Facebook and their VBC experience and making that a single pane of glass. But we're also taking our app store, you know, people have like the app store, the app exchange, Salesforce yeah. does it, you know, a lot yeah. of our competitors do it. We do that. 
but our app exchange, our, our app store is all providers that use us, you know, our API stack on the back end. So you're still maintaining consistency there. So we have like auth via where I can buy that right through Vonage, right? And right through my application. And I can now enable my UCC to send SMS messages to receive and request payments in a completely PCI compliant manner, right? Just little things like that, visual services, um, doxy services for telehealth. I'm just embedding that because it's a single stack into my UC platform and consolidating everything together. So there's there's some fun benefits there, but again, it really becomes, it moves the needle when it becomes a product more so. You're gonna get the customization and the custom builds, um, but that's not really where the majority of our customers live, to be honest. No, I, I like that approach. I mean, you hear, you hear different things about applications now and security, the pandemic's kind of raised some eyebrows on a couple of different mainstream suppliers with security um, who again shall remain nameless and stay in classy kind of mindset. But, you know, the, these providers that you had, they're using you guys, they're in the store. Have they passed some sort of certification? I think we lost Kevin. Oh, there he is. He's um, back. He's back. He's back. Um, are, are there certain suppliers that when you look at these people that are in your app store, have you Outside of just the obvious, they use you, use them. I mean, are they passing some sort of certification for security? Because that is a big thing. You mentioned telehealth. You've mentioned uh, credit card payments. And I, I get nervous with people in these kind of, again, I've used the term dot com. We're kind of back in that dot com field where people just kind of click, yeah, I accept the terms and conditions now. But what, what, sort, of, what sort of muster are these guys passing to, to get onto that platform? Because that's a major concern for people now. So we make a very... Um stringent process to say you're part of our app store, but we're certainly not going to tell people not to develop using our APIs. So the products that are out there are the products that are out there, but the ones you see in our app store is, is if they're, if they're claiming PCI compliance and they're, com they're claiming HIPAA compliance and we're billing for that and we're signing BAAs for customers, et cetera, you better believe that they're going to be tried out on the back end. But a lot of this stuff is because they're using us, for the actual communication and data transfer. Sure. We already know where that's going. <laughs> yeah, they're know? riding your backbone. They're, 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 just, they're just a fancy front end to the, to the brains that you're running. It's not just a fancy app. It's part of our platform. It's just something that has already been developed, right? Yeah. yeah. Taking advantage of all the developers out there and making it accessible to our customers without reinventing the wheel. You know, if something's great and you did a good job, we're going to pat you on the back and resell it. Yeah. Why not? No, I, I agree. Listen, make, you know, go best of breed, follow what's out there. And it kind of fits in your model of saying, you know, we're not trying to be everything to everybody, but let's right. enable the right paths where the right paths are needed. Exactly. Now, just switch gears a little, because Kevin brings up the pandemic. And I, and I do like, there's some interesting things right now with the pandemic and, um, and what you're seeing good, what you're seeing bad from suppliers right now. I mean, what do you see? Have you seen any really cool mistakes that companies have made that you've been able to fix in this pandemic? Have you seen anything because... Your 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 role is interesting because you probably have how many sales guys roll to you? How many sales guys and gals roll up through you, right? You know, the East Coast. I'll the East Coast, yeah, yeah. The East Coast comes to you. So you probably get a call every hour with, hey, I thought of this or, hey, somebody came to me with this problem. I mean, what are you seeing out there right now? Could you have anything really cool you could talk about that's, um, hey, they were doing this really wacky and we came in and did that real quick in the pandemic? I mean, there's a million, there's a million stories that you can kind of touch base on there. Um, my, my stuff, I, I almost tend to oversimplify things just to kind of make it less convoluted because what happens that. with it, it's, it's like you start talking about the art of the possible and you just like lose people or they get excited, but they don't know why they leave their meeting and they're like, well, I don't even know how I'm going to execute on that. So I'm all about okay, this is really cool, but let's talk about how we can actually implement these solutions, especially in the existing pandemic. Like how quick can we actually get that up and running? I do see surprisingly a lot of network stuff um, where people have really stubbed their toe on their network builds or they're really behind on network technology because what happens is now I have a private network, right? I have an existing MPLS and everyone needs to go home. Yeah. Shoot, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like that, yeah. I don't I've got really this great closed secure network. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's really great. But like, you need to also communicate outside of that, you know, castle, right? You need to kind of make a bridge over that moat, if you will. Yeah, and yeah. that's a hard lift to do. 
And so we've come up with some um, very kind of very cool SD WAN solutions. I mean, you don't want to kind of go VDI in the UC space because that's messy too. But there's a lot of conversations that we have around network topology and what's possible. And I think a lot of what you're talking about with compliance is a huge proponent of that too. What can I have that's out of the box today and deploy that's still as secure as my tight layer two network where it was just hub and spoke and nobody have ever left except from this one data center and these five firewalls, yeah. you know? And now there's 7,000 um, people hitting thing. that. Yeah, that's a hard thing to swallow. And so when you look at, you know, the software deployments, I mean, I think that's the baseline of it. You know, there's a lot of other cool stories like the telehealth world, you know, it's spinning up 24 hour things that way and AI functionality and that kind of cool stuff. Um, but that's really the nuts and the bolts of what people need right now. Uh, we also did a free conferencing.com, free Vonage conferencing.com. So we used our, you know, we just built out our own Vonage meetings on our TalkBox APIs. And so when we look at making, we just made that free for a period of time. So we're like, hey, anyone who needs a conferencing solution that's secure and clientless, use this, right? And we, we even had some telehealth, you know, smaller end, of course, but, you know, using that um, for telehealth services as well. So those are kind of the, the types of things that we've spun up quickly that are, that are a little bit cooler. But I think, I mean, it's the engineer in me, but I'm, but I'm like, I'm not going to tell you a crazy story. It's the nuts and bolts that get people working out of the office. You know, you know and there's yeah, some leave that to the sales guys. We're going to run around and sell the art of the possible. You know, the this is great. Everyone wants, and then everyone leaves and it's like, I have no idea how we're going to do that. But yeah. it sounded great. But you, you bring up so, so Kevin runs um, the, the carrier services side of the business with the networking technologies and the voice services. But you bring up SD WAN there. Maybe I can hand it off there because what are you doing in the SD WAN space? Because I, I, I heard what you're saying there. I've seen some proposals where you guys are throwing in SD WAN applications. Maybe we can just hit up that a little bit because that, that's a uniqueness to your offering. It is, yeah. And it's really an, an, a conversation that people need to have when they're moving away from prem, especially at market. Because if I've had a Cisco system or an Avaya system and it's been self-hosted for years, and now I'm considering cloud, I guarantee my network isn't prepared to go cloud, okay? So you need to have that network. But VoIP is VoIP. VoIP is VoIP. What's the problem? Over the internet. Yeah, well, when you're centrally draining internet, VoIP isn't so cool, right? <laughs> um, so that's just not, not a great solution there. So when we bring in SD-WAN, I, I mean, I personally think that there's a huge value add to having Vonage be your SD-WAN provider. We're reselling Velo. Be very frank with that, okay? We don't we didn't build our own SD WAN architecture, right? We are reselling Velo, but they too are in AWS instances, so it's right next to all of our clusters, and so it's a great solution. And um, we also have a lot of partners that sell Velo, and we like Velo because we vetted. We were one of the first providers, honestly, to do Velo, and we ended up doing it on our private network initially, uh, in conjunction with our with our Broadworks clusters. And as we did our own proprietary infrastructure and built that out in AWS, we transitioned that into using Velo gateways because then we can go global um, and we can actually have our own orchestrator instance, which is the management and the reporting and all of that in the prioritization portal um, so that we can specify it to us and we have expertise internally and we're actually enhancing our um, financial SLAs on, the, on that front as well when it comes to voice. Because you know we're we're out of the circuit realm now, and we weren't always. We were MPLS providers. We were buying last mile and plugging that right back into our private network for years. You know, I mean, a decade ago. But that was a big proponent of quality of service. And then SD WAN came out, and we were one of the first. And we vetted all of them, and we continue to vet all of them. And we really like Velo for a multitude of reasons, specifically voice and video related. Um, but we're also taking on all of the network. Um, and data requirements on that front as well, right? So if you want Office 365 prioritization and, you know, you're in Azure or, you know, you, there's other things that you need to do, we can accommodate that as well. But it's a nice marriage to get it from the voice provider because when you think about prioritization, what's the most sensitive thing? Voice. So wouldn't you love for your voice provider to be the responsible party to prioritize that over your existing network? You know, that's there's a huge value add there and then we SLA it on the back end too, financially. So that's that's the short story on Vonage and SD WAN. No, that's cool. I mean, when when you you get into that side of the fence, I I like that thought of have one throat to choke, one bat to one back to pat on that kind of front there because it 
it's that missing layer that people do forget. They do forget that last mile connectivity portion. Everyone says, internet's internet. I have some pipes, I'm good to go, or I'll just deploy mm -hmm. a leg out from my MPLS network. But now this pandemic is unique. This pandemic has given people that had, I heard a story the other day of a very major financial firm spent millions of dollars, you know, whatever, whatever amount of dollars on a hardened physical data center for people to get to work their DR site, right? And not that that was a bad investment, but it was the wrong investment for this type of a pandemic, right? No one can go there. You can't have a DR site with 600 people that can go there, which this one does. No one can get there. No one can go there. You can't have the people around each other. So this one's kind of unique. And that, that, that ability to flex on demand, that ability to roll out kind of the capabilities of what you're talking about, you can do things that fit a variety of disaster recovery strategies as opposed to just simply, hey, hey, it's a 9-11 and there's a week in which we can't get here, but everyone can go back, or it's a Sandy. This one's very unique. I mean, we, I've heard, depending on who you talk to or depending on what, what Cuomo and Trump do today in their meeting, um, yeah. we'll, we'll see if that, you know, to, that'll be the Thunderdome of meetings in Washington, but we'll <laughs> see where they fit in terms of when this is going to end in a certain regard. I mean, some people are saying mm -hmm. late 2021 before we're out of our houses. I mean, that's, late that's crazy. Late 2021? That, I, I, I've heard different stories. It's crazy. You know, I've heard some people say December. Some people saying Cuomo's strategy was, Cuomo says we're not at the end of the road until the pandemic, until there's a vaccine. And yeah. you, you carry that through to its logical thought. So yeah, people are saying that. It's kind of crazy. But you guys but you have a different flexibility. At, yeah, and you also look at, you know, regardless of when the end is, since that's the unknown component here, is it has we still changed the work from home policy in a lot of these companies? I mean, now that you can, are you going to keep doing it? Because employees are going to demand it too, because, you know, there's a huge benefit there and there's a huge cost savings to companies too. I mean, even Vonage as a, as a corporation has a ton of work from home, predominantly work from home, because we drink our own Kool-Aid, right? Yeah. Um, we eat our own dog food on that front, but we still had offices that are now closed, and there's a cost savings on that front too, you know? Um, so is, is it going to change the scope moving forward regardless of when the pandemic ends, you know? And, you know, Velo too just came to the table with their yeah. own at-home box that's specific for that you know i had the security component but i also have a private leg because i don't want to see all of the stuff that your kids are doing on the internet either right yeah. we don't want to see all of that <laughs> or have that coming through our data centers um so we can piece that out so they're also evolving their technology on that front too with a smaller box more cost effective but also addressing that that privacy arm because it's still going to be tied into your home personal network so it's an interesting climate i think a lot of things are going to remain changed Regardless, I don't think we're going to bounce back like a rubber band to where we were before, regardless. Yeah, I kind of, I've, I've grown to hate that phrase, the new normal. But I mean, you, you're looking at this as if ever there was a case study for the efficacy of working at home, right? This is the world's largest case study on if this is going to work, work at home employees, right? You've got, you've got employees who are at home, who are scared about getting sick, who have all their kids home with them and are still working, right? So where's the productivity measurement for this? Because if it worked here, it's only going to get better when all those other external factors aren't there, right? I mean, this is the case study. This is the thing that says, does work at home work or does work at home have challenges? And it's going to be tough for the guy that says, I hate work at home to, sh to, to keep, to keep, you know, kind of to keep riding that down the street saying work at home doesn't work. If the statistics show that it still works, even in this crazy world. I mean, this is nuts. Mm -hmm. This is nuts what we're seeing right now. It really do you, is. I know. Do you, do you look at this and say, you know, I, I know you're not a contact center manager and I know, but, but you're in this realm, you're talking to the sales guys. Are you hearing any universal stories or universal um, thoughts from people that say, I'm looking at these five stats or I'm looking at these three things to say if this is really going to work or not, or I'm looking at security or compliance or uh, engagement rates. Like, what are you hearing from people saying, this will, I'll judge that this work at home stuff worked if this happens. I think that it, it's interesting because I, I think that there's two schools of thought here. And a lot of this comes from my personal experience with working in an office environment versus working from home. I, for one, get so much more done at home 
<laughs> just because <laughs> the sheer people don't stop by and chat with me to be honest you know maybe i'm sure an antisocial don't. engineer but they don't they're not interrupting my day you know and that's the same thing in a context center solution people are human we're innately conversational and we want to be social and so i think that uh there's more there's more there's more to get done at home, you know, because you're just tied to your desk and, you know, you work more hours, you don't have to commute. That too, uh, that being said, it is all about reporting. And so I think that whether you're going to game the system as an agent sitting in an office or sitting at home, I personally don't think that matters because I can still see everything. Okay. I can still see the trends and the KPIs that say you're gaming the system. I can still listen and I don't have to listen to recordings now that you have AI things. I can pull things and pull short call times and pull reports that are more driven towards gaming the system because that's really what you're concerned about from an agent perspective because you're not walking the floor and you're not actually seeing them from your ivory tower, you know, with your glass window office up there yeah. on, on level two. Sure. You're not what's watching the, what's the biggest, take calls. So what's the biggest feature then that you're seeing with companies who are making rather rapid deployments to home-based environments like what's the one feature that is the predominant you know shiny thing they feel is the the big, big advantage of going to a base uh no from our when we're looking at our features and functionality, we're probably seeing conversation analyzer as the the sexiest feature for in a work from home environment. Because now I'm taking all phrasing, I'm taking things that I need I need you to say. Because it's very rare in a in a contact center that there's not some sort of scripted or component level things that I'm covering in the types of calls that I'm that I'm gauging. So as I'm seeing those, I can see quantities. I can see when people aren't saying things. I can see when people are saying things. And I know which call recordings to look at because I think that the call recording is a true view into live what's happening at any given time, right? I listen to that conversation. I know you're doing your job and I know that you're taking calls. Um, so you have, I think, call times, I think are huge too. And status is huge as well. And real-time monitoring. But when we talk about historical reporting and KPIs, it's that conversation analyzer. I can see the conversations that are happening. I can see if people are getting lazy. I can see if they're not hitting all of the, the um, compliances that I need them to hit in a conversation or they're not being polite or they're not using sales effectiveness phrasing because they don't hear it echoing in their ears from their colleagues, all doing best practices. So I can see those best practices in addition to, you know, remote gamification type functionality as well. But I think I can see what's being said in the quality because KPIs and contact center will innately show you the behavior and the activity and the call volume that people are going to have. Everyone's going to do that. So I think conversation analyzer is unique in that fact where I don't have to listen to 50% of the calls now as a supervisor. I can still listen to one to 3% but it's the ones that I need to listen to that are automatically pulled out using AI like Einstein analytics of Salesforce to say, these are the ones that are problematic. These are the ones that are good. These are the ones that are middle of the road, not performing. And you can compare in office with work from home segmentations as well and say, this is the difference I see in conversations that are happening um, without needing to listen to all of those calls or live monitor all those calls. Cause you don't have enough time in the day. So I would, I would pick that as my favorite feature for work from home. So we've taken up a good amount of your time today. Um, is there anything that, and I, and I really do appreciate it. So thank you. I want to make sure I, I get that out. Thank you yes, very much you, for your time. Of course. I know in the middle of what, you, what everyone's going through here that with you managing the East coast, I can't imagine how many calls you've missed in this hour that we've been on the phone. It's refreshing. Um, it's refreshing <laughs> not to have to, not to have to live in your inbox, right? I'm, I actually want to do yeah. a postmortem on this call to see how many emails came in right now. You how you how crushed you were on an email. Yeah. I don't want to. But <laughs> she said, I'll I don't want to. Yes. I don't want to. Um, but is there anything that uh, is there anything you want to close out on? Any thoughts? Any any advice or, or, or any any sort of anecdotes that you kind of have that you say you know what? Uh, think of this. Think of us. Or or make don't make the mistake of this when you when you when you're looking at you guys. Don't make the, yeah. There's a lot of don't make the mistake of of this with Vonage because we are. I mean, 
we are enterprise, we are at market. And I think that the, the, the branding is now changing to address that. And we don't have to be all things to all people, but it makes huge difference. The fact that we own our own IP stack top to bottom with the UC, CC and programmability. I think that that's really our differentiator in this space. Um, and you're not going to see anyone else attack that market in a quick in a quick manner, right? Because it's taken us years to, um, to, to combine everything on the back end. Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, I gotta tell you, thank you very much. Um, Thanks, Steve. I really do appreciate the time for you. This has been great. All right.